Hi, team, and welcome. Uh, I'm Jeff Walser, the Vice President of Exploratory Science here at IBM Research, and uh, I'm really happy today uh, to start what's going to be a, a series of periodic talks we're going to be doing over, over the next several months. Um, hopefully, many of you got to join our first Distinguished Speakers series uh, with Yoshio Bengio a few weeks ago. Um, and of course, we'll continue to bring in Distinguished Speakers from outside. But as IBM researchers, we actually have the pleasure each day of working and collaborating with an amazing array of the world's most brilliant minds right here in the labs. Uh, some of our colleagues have been recognized with very high honors by the external scientific community for making foundational um, advances, which have transformed a technical area or an entire industry, or even for starting an entirely new field of research. In some cases, we may work with these individuals for years uh, without fully coming to appreciate the contributions that they've actually made to science and, and to IBM. Uh, so these stories are an inspiring example internally even of imminent careers in research and stories which we can all learn from. Uh, therefore, on occasion, we'll be uh, inviting distinguished members of our community to tell their story in what we're calling an IBM Research Special Seminar, uh, describing their notable technical accomplishments, reflecting on their career path, and, and sharing the inspiration that made these possible. So today, I'm excited to welcome Ron Fagan, IBM Fellow at the Almond Research Center. Uh, Ron is recognized in the computer science community as a, found, as a founder of relational database theory and the creator of the field of, in, of finite model theory. He's also authored seminal work in the field of information integration and aggregation and of reasoning about knowledge. His work advanced both the theory and practice of modern computing systems, especially data management systems. Ron's key inventions used in IBM products include extendable hashing, uh, differential data backup, and critical tools for database design. Ron has earned a long list of distinctions through his 47-year career at IBM Research. He is an ACM Fellow, an IEEE Life Fellow, and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, the work Ron has published with his colleagues has been awarded the 2014 Goodall Prize and the 2020 Alonzo Church Award, some of the world's highest honors for research in theoretical computer science and logic. And he's a member of three prestigious national academies, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and most recently, the National Academy of Sciences. So that's a three for for the National Academies Forum. Um, Ron is also known among his coworkers, anyone in Albany in particular, for his unfailing cheer and kindness. Uh, and he's always a favorite uh, with the, the interns who are in town. Um, when we used to have all hands in the auditorium, he had a special seat right in the front where he could always ask the very first question uh, after every talk. And he's always open to answering questions as well. He's known as well for his remarkably quick wit and his remarkably slow driving speed, as anyone can attest to, if we follow him <laughs> up the Almaden Hill. Uh, but today, Ron will share some perspectives on applying theory to practice and practice to theory, gained through the course of his notable career. In this talk, Ron will describe two case studies from his career in which the mutual benefit of close collaboration between theoreticians and practitioners combined to propel significant scientific and technological advances. Um, I'd also like to introduce Alex Gray, the VP of Foundations of AI at the IBM TJ Watson Research Lab. Um, he'll be my co-host. Alex will be moderating the question and answer period at the end of Ron's seminar. Please use the Q&A panel on your console to submit any questions you have throughout today's session, and then we'll get to them at the end. So with that, uh, no more further ado, Ron, welcome, and thanks for sharing your experiences and inspiring story with us today. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, I was not ready for the dry, slow driving part, but that's interesting <laughs> to hear. Anyway, so hello, everybody. Uh, so welcome to my talk. So uh, now the purpose of today's talk is to, a purpose is to encourage collaboration between theoreticians and system builders. I call them practitioners, but Laura Haas objected. She told me, call them system builders. It sounds better. So system builders it is. Uh, and I'm going to do this, as, as Jeff mentioned, of two case studies. Uh, one of these case studies was initiated by the theoreticians and the other by the practitioners. Uh, now, uh, there's several messages here for theory people. And one message is how to apply theory to practice and why this leads to better theory. Uh, and for uh, practitioners or system, system builders, to the uh, value of theory and the value of involving theoreticians in your work. So in the first case study started way back in 1996, Garlic, and Laura Haas came up to me. Now, Laura Haas uh, at the time was just a first level manager, but later on she became an IBM fellow. She became the director of computer science. Uh, but she knocked on my door one day, way back in 1996, and said, uh, okay, Mr. Database Theoretician, we've got a problem with Garlic, our multimedia database system. 
Now, what was Laura's problem? Well, here's what it was. So garlic is a middleware system. It's on top of other systems. So, uh, so it's on, on top of things like uh, 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 D DB2, which is a relational database system, on top of Cubic, which is queried by uh, image content, where you can query on the basis of color, shape, or texture, and on top of other stuff, too. So, uh, so now the problem Laura had was that the answers uh, were not compatible, she's getting. The answers in DB2 were sets, and we'll see an example in a second, whereas the answers in Cubic are sort of, list, sort of like what you get in Google. You know, you get a list of answers, you don't get a set. Uh, so, uh, so now, uh, so let's look at this, an example. So let's say uh, we have the CD database, uh, and you're searching for artist equals the Beatles, uh, say in DB2. So you get, DB2 won't have this fancy thing appearing, but you would get a set of albums. Now this is from Music Brains, which has 12 million CDs in its, in its collection. Um, now, uh, so let's say we have the uh, query album color equals red. Well, you get a sorted list, and here's, here's what you get back from Music Brains. Uh, the reddest thing first, I guess counting red pixels, and with a redness score there. Um, and uh, so now, uh, how would you make sense of a query like artist equals Beatles and album color equals red? Well, you'll say, come on, Ron, big deal. Uh, we'll just have a list of albums by the Beatles sorted by how red they are. What could be easier than that? Okay, smart person. What about uh, artist equals Beatles or album color equals red? Not at all clear what you do, is it? And how about, let's say we're doing this multimedia query, color is red and shape is round. How would you make sense of that? How would you give an answer to that? So that's what I dealt with. So what was my solution? Well, first of all, it's often the case that when a practitioner asks a theoretician a problem, they leave out something important. Uh, and what Laura left out was that these weren't just sorted lists, they were scored lists. You saw with the redness thing, there was a score there. I thought, aha, scores. Uh, and so I thought, gee, now we're in there, we can match these things up. Sets are scored lists also. Zero if it's not in, one if it's in. So they're both scored lists. So I can combine these scored lists. Wonderful. Uh, and that reminded me of real value logic. Some flavors of that are called fuzzy logic, where th things have scores, not necessarily zero or one, but in between zero and one, and you deal with that. Now, in uh, real value logic, uh, conjunction is often taken to be the min. This is what uh, uh, was the, the original motivation uh, in, in doing uh, fuzzy logic by Zada. He took conjunction to be the min and disjunction to be the max, but people use other other rules and other real value logics. Uh, so then so I said, great. I went back to Laura and said, Laura, good news. I've got a solution for you. Use real value logic. I was happy. I thought I was done. And Laura said, well, hmm. She says, you know, I like your solution. She says, but you know, we need a practical algorithm. We can't just look at every object in the database, get its, say, redness score and roundness score, if that's what you're looking for. It's, it scores in every attribute and use real value logic to compute the answer. We just can't afford that, Ron. We need an efficient algorithm. So I thought, hmm. So I scratched my head, came back to her a couple of days later and said, Laura, good news. I've got an efficient algorithm. Instead of linear time n, where n is the number of items in the database, where you have to look at everything, it's square root of n. So you can use square root of n axis and get the top k. So, so that's great. I was very happy. But Laura said, and I'll never forget her answer, she said, good. She said, certainly better than linear. She said, but you know, we database people are spoiled. We're used to log in, things like B-trees. So she said to me, and I really, I'll never forget it, be smarter, go get me a login algorithm. So I thought, hmm. So I scratched my head, came back to her a couple of days later and said, guess what, Laura? I can prove you can't do any better than square root of n. That's it. No better algorithm. She said, fine, okay, we'll take it. And they implemented it in garlic. Now, the uh, let's just see the difference between n and square root of n. Time for the accesses. Let's go back to Music Brains with its 12 million CDs. So uh, now, if you assume 1,000 accesses per second, uh, uh, n, you know, searching every item of the n items of the database, would take, in the naive algorithm, would take about three hours. Square root of n, 
about three seconds. So it's a huge win to do square root of n versus n. So generalizing the algorithm, well, you know, we theoreticians like to generalize things. So the algorithm would work not just for uh, min or anything like that, but any monotone scoring function, one where if you increase the scores, you can't decrease the overall answer. Uh, so influence, well, first of all, the algorithm was in, implemented in garlic. Uh, and it's influenced a number of IBM products, including the ones on this list. Uh, 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 Watson uh, uh, Bundle Search System, uh, uh, Infosphere Federation Server, uh, WebSphere Commerce, and others. So it influenced a number of IBM products. Uh, and the paper that enters the algorithm, which, by the way, is now called Fagan's algorithm, uh, has about 2,000 citations, according to to uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Academic. By the way, I use Microsoft Academic instead of Google Scholar because it gives more and gives, gives a bigger number. They they search more stuff. So you know why not give the bigger number? Okay. Uh, okay. I see a comment on my screen. I can't read it, but okay. So now, um, uh, so now something happened though in 2001. So Amnon Lodum, Moni Naor, and I came up with a new algorithm, which we called the threshold algorithm. Uh, and, and just to, instead of just telling you the algorithm, I'll tell you what the problem is, just be more concrete. So there are N, uh, there are M attributes, let's say, uh, redness and roundness, we'll take M to be two in our example. Uh, and every object has a score for each of these attributes. It's got a redness score and a roundness score, for example, in our example. Um, and now, uh, so we have M sort of lists, like a redness list and a roundness list. And, uh, and now our goal is to find the top K objects according to some monotone scoring function while minimizing database accesses. That's our goal. That's, that's the problem. So here's an example. Uh, here's a table with redness and roundness. So object 177 is the very reddest object. It's got a score of 0.993. As you see in the upper left, in the bottom right, you see it's not so round. It's got a score of 0.406, so it's a little bit round. Uh, in the upper right corner, you see object 235 with a roundness of 0.999. That's probably a circle. But in the bottom left, you see it's not so not so red. There's its redness score. So uh, so now uh, so now let's talk about scoring functions. So let F be a scoring function. So as I said, the one commonly used. Uh, like Zada used in Fuzzy Logic was min. Uh, there's many others you can use, one of which is average. It turns out that in real life, they've done psychological studies on people, and when you use average and give the answer with the highest average, people like the answer better. So average is a good good choice. Um, so let x1 through xm be the scores of object R. It's redness score and it's roundness score in our example. Uh, and then... Uh, f of x1 through xm, you, you apply your scoring function f, is the overall score. We may write that as f of r. So that's the score of object r uh, in this, uh, under this function f. And so now, um, now here's a formal definition of monotone. A function f is monotone if whenever the xi's are less than the yi's, then f of the xi's is less than what f of the yi's. So modes of access, well, a cubic is limited in its access. It has two flavors of access. Sorted access, where you say, give me the reddest thing, the next reddest, the third reddest, and so on. That's sorted access. And also random access. Maybe you just saw some object with a high redness score, and you say, what is this roundness score? So you can go ask, what's the roundness? You can go ask for that. Um, and now our goal, as I said, to minimize the number of accesses to the database. So, uh, so we want an algorithm to find the top k object. K, k is 10, for example. Now, the naive algorithm goes and looks at absolutely everything, finds the top k, and gives the answer back. But that's way too expensive, as Laura made very clear to me. So uh, we want to do better than that. So here's the algorithm that we came up with. Uh, and then look at Moni now, and I, the threshold algorithm. So how does it work? Well, it does sorted access in parallel to each of the lists. So it does a uh, sorted access to the redness list and to the roundness list. And then, uh, and as soon as you see an object under sorted access in one of the lists, you go get a score in the other list. So uh, if you get a, an object appeared uh, in the redness list, high at the list, you go get its roundness score. And then you can compute its overall score because you have all of its the, uh, values and all of its attributes. So you get its overall score. And then 
uh, if this is one of the top K objects you've seen, great, remember it. This is a candidate for the final top K. It's one of the top K so far, and you, you throw away anything that it replaces. Uh, so you have your current top K list. Uh, and now we need a stopping rule. When do we stop? Well, for each of these objects, uh, you see, for each of these lists, I, uh, uh, let T sub I be the last object you saw under sorted axis. So this is the last object you saw under sorted axis in the redness list and the roundness list. You have those, the, sc the scores. And then you define the threshold T to be take your, your fun scoring function F and apply it to those thresholds. Now, that is not the score of any object, but still it makes mathematical sense. You can apply F to these numbers. And we'll call that the threshold T. And here's our stopping rule. As soon as you've seen K objects whose overall score is at least T, stop and output your current top K list. That's the algorithm. So let's see why it's good. Let's, first, let's see an example. So here we go. So here's the redness list and the roundest list, object 17. We got the top red, the reddest object and the roundest object. And now for the top red objects, you get a score in the roundest list down there, that bottom right. And for the uh, top object you've seen so far in the roundest list, you go get its, its redness score. And then you compute their overall scores by applying your, your scoring function F to them. You get their overall scores. So we can, we'll say min for simplicity in our example. So object 177 is the min of 0.993 and 0.406. So it's 0.406. So that's its score. And, and this is the threshold so far. You, you take the scoring function f, which is the min, applied to the last things you saw in sorted axis. So it's the min of these two numbers, uh, 0 0.993, 0 0.999, which is 0 0.999. And you keep on going. And you keep doing that process. And you'll notice the threshold keeps dropping. Now it's the min of these two smaller numbers. You keep going. And now it's the min of these two smaller numbers. So the threshold keeps on dropping. And you're waiting and you're, you're watching carefully to see if you have k objects whose score is at least that threshold. So now let's say, why is this halting rule correct? Why is the threshold algorithm successfully stopping then and not making a mistake? <clears throat> well, uh, suppose uh, you have k objects so far whose score is at least t the threshold. Uh, what could go wrong? Well, what could go wrong is you have some object r you have not seen yet somewhere deep in one of these lists. Uh, you have some object S in your top K, but the score of R is bigger than the score of S. Then you've screwed up. So let's show this bad thing cannot happen. You cannot screw up like that. Well, uh, let's say uh, R has scores X1 through XM. It's got a readiness score and a roundness score. So now, uh, since you haven't seen object R yet, its score at the XI is less than one to TI. You haven't seen it yet. So in each of the lists, its score is less than the, that, th that threshold value TI for that list. So now we're going to apply monotonicity. The score of object R is F of these XIs, which by monotonicity is less than or equal to F of the TIs. <clears throat> well, by definition, F of the TIs is the threshold T. Uh, and now we know that uh, the score of S is at least T, because that was in our final stopping list. So we stopped when this object, we had K objects whose score was at least T. So, but now you see there's a contradiction. Up above, we have F of R is bigger than F of S. And down here, we have f of r less than or equal to f of s. Contradiction, so this bad thing cannot happen. So indeed, the stopping rule is indeed correct. So now we found this wonderful notion in working on the threshold algorithm, something we call instance optimality, a, a wonderful magical property of an algorithm. So let me tell you what it is. So let's say A is the class of algorithms, uh, legal algorithms for a problem. D is the class of legal inputs, I'm thinking of these as databases, so I may call them databases. Now, for each algorithm A in the set of A algorithms and D in the set of inputs or databases, it's got a cost of applying algorithm A to input D. And some, it, this cost may be the number of accesses, it may be time, it may be whatever, but you have some scoring, some cost. And now, here's what it means to be instance optimal. So this algorithm A, in uh, bold A is instance optimal over bold A and bold D, the set of possible algorithms and possible databases, if there's some constant C1 and C2, such that for the if the adversary picks an algorithm A prime and the algorithm and the adversary picks a database D, that's his choice. The cost of running your algorithm on the adversary's database 
is less than or equal to C1 times the cost of the adversary running his algorithm on his database plus C, C2. I mean, that's pretty heavy duty because he, the adversary can fine tune his algorithm to his database. He can fine tune his database to his algorithm. A pretty brutal condition to have to have to be able to do that. And we'll, we'll refer this number C1 as the optimality ratio, this multiplicative factor. So now I'm claiming the threshold algorithm is instance optimal. So, so now you might think that follows because you might say, well, the next object you see might have score equal to the threshold values. So, uh, so this is why you can't do any better. But unfortunately, that doesn't quite go through. Life is a little more delicate. So we need another notion that I'll tell you about that we're going to forbid, something called wild guesses. So what wild guess is, is you ask for a score of an object you've never seen before um, under random access. So not something you've seen under sorted access, but for some reason, just out of thin air, you say, you know, I'm out of the blue. I've never seen object 393, but tell me its redness score. That's a wild guess. You have no good reason to do it. It's not appeared in any of the lists. That's a wild guess. Uh, now, neither Fagan's algorithm nor the threshold algorithm make these wild guesses. And in fact, your system may not even allow wild guesses. So now here's the theorem. For uh, every monotone F, uh, uh, let A be a class of algorithms that are legal. They always give the right answer for every input. Uh, and uh, it does not make any wild guesses. Then, and D is a class of all inputs or databases, then the threshold algorithm is instance optimal over these. So we have a theorem proving it is instance optimal under these assumptions. The only tricky assumption is no L guesses. Uh, now, oh, I went up, oops, let me back up a second, sorry. Um, so, sorry about that. Okay, so now, uh, the late David Johnson came to my office one day, and I very proudly told him this theorem about instance optimality. And he said, you know, Ron, he said, I would have a sterner notion of instance optimality. Not only the stuff you say, but it's got to have the best possible optimality ratio, that constant C1. I thought, oh, man, that's an interesting, hard problem. So I went back to my office or uh, the next day, and I, I found the optimality ratio. It's this complicated thing. M is the number of lists, like two if it's radius and roundness. C sub R is the cost of random access. C sub S is the cost of assorted access. This is the optimality ratio for the threshold algorithm, and I proved it's best possible. So it's uh, among all instance optimal algorithms. So, so it's instance optimal in that strong David Johnson sense. So, uh, so then, great, I went to Laura. I said, Laura, new algorithm, threshold algorithm, even better than Fagan's algorithm, because optimal in a stronger sense is not a worst case sense, the usual method, or average case, but in, in every case, it's optimal at every instance. And Laura said, Ron, we implemented your algorithm all over the place. You told me it was optimal. What's going on? I said, well, Laura, there's optimal, and then there's optimal. So that, that was the way it was. Influence. Well, so we submitted this paper uh, to Pods 2001. It's a top database theory conference. And I was really worried. You saw the threshold algorithm. It takes about 11 lines to write it down. And I thought, man, oh, man, the program committee is going to look at this and say, are you kidding me? Uh, we're the top database theory conference, and we're going to accept a paper with an 11-line algorithm? Forget it. Reject. So I thought, how am I going to get around this? So I thought, aha. So what I did is, in both the abstract and the introduction, I called it a remarkably simple algorithm, turning a bug into a feature. That's a, something good to remember if you're trying to get a paper accepted at a conference. Turn the bug into a feature, a remarkably simple algorithm. And the paper not only was accepted, but it won the best paper award. So it really, really worked. Um, and the paper was very influential. Uh, it's got 3,800 citations. Uh, it won the Test of Time Award you know, 10 years after the conference. Uh, and I won the IEEE Technical Achievement Award for Figures Algorithm and Threshold Algorithm together. And then the biggie, the Girdle Prize. This is the highest prize for paper in theoretical computer science. And this paper won the Girdle Prize. You can't do any better than that for a paper in theoretical computer science. And I just mentioned that there's something called Jim Pods. They looked back over the last 20 or 30 years and said, what are the best papers that have ever appeared in pods. Let's have it in 2016 was the very first time they did it. And this was one of the two papers selected. And they told me by the way, it was a top rated among those two for Jim's and pods. So, um, 
So it's got a gazillion applications. I'm certainly not going to read this to you, but one reason why it's been so influential and one reason around the Girl Prize is people have, use it all over the place in many, many, many different applications. Measures of success. Well, making our products better, that's certainly a ultimate measure of, of uh, success for a practitioner. Creating a new subfield, that is an ultimate measure of success for a theoretician. And uh, so we did both of these. Uh, and if I want to make an argument to a theoretician, you will do better theory if you just talk to those practitioners. I cannot make a stronger argument than this. Here's a paper that arose from a very practical, real-world problem, and by golly, it won the Girdle Prize. What more could you ask? I mean, that's the strongest argument I could get to a theoretician. Talk to those, those messy old practitioners. Second case study, Clio. Uh, so um, now, Clio... Uh, uh, is deals with data exchange. I'll explain in a moment what that means, where you convert data from one format to another. Now, Laura Haas uh, left uh, uh, Garlic and after it was successful and implemented and started Clio, and I followed her. She was never my manager. I was in the theory group, but I thought, Laura, you know, I had a wonderful success with Laura before. I will start going to Laura's meetings, and I actually sat in Clio meetings for a full year. Uh, and then something happened. So the four of us, Vicky and Kalaitis, Renee Miller, Uchin Popa, and I said, look, let's do, how would we do data to day change from scratch if we didn't have any, you know, thing that all this work has gone into uh, Clio, just start from scratch what we do. By the way, Renee Miller is very sensitive about her picture. She will not allow her picture to be public. So that's a picture of Renee Miller, age three. So she allowed me to use that. So she was not a child prodigy. That was what, that's the picture she allowed me to use. So... Data exchange. So you have a source database uh, and a target, uh, and you're trying to convert data from one format to another. I'll give an example in a second. So for, oh, here's the example. So let's say you're merging two different companies. One of them has an employee-manager relationship, and the other has an employee-department-department manager relationship. And we want to merge these two. So we want to somehow combine this. So here's where we're going to use data exchange. What do we do? So now a... Uh, there's something called tuple generating dependencies, or TGDs, which has been used in the past for a number of contexts, including uh, normalization. Uh, and this is what we're going to use to describe it. As I said, it's originally used for other senses. So here's the tuple generating dependency, or TGD, we would use in this case. We say if uh, uh, tuple EM is an employee manager relationship, so employee E is manager M, and there's some department D where employee E is in department D and department D is managed by uh, manager M. So now here's an example. We have this database here. Girdle is reporting to Hilbert, Turing is reporting to Hilbert, and Hilbert's reporting to Gauss. Now I'm gonna give you three possible databases that you can convert this to, and you're gonna think about which one you want. Uh, now if I were doing this in person, which I, when I give this talk in person, I'd make people vote. I say, here's the three answers. How many vote for number one, number two, and number three? And people don't do very well on that. But here, you have to privately vote yourself and see how you did. OK, so here's solution number one. So we name the department after the manager. We say Girdle is in the Hilbert department, which is managed by Hilbert. Turing's in the Hilbert department, managed by Hilbert. And Hilbert's in the Gauss department, managed by Gauss. So that's solution number one. Solution number two, you create these dummy values, uh, D1, D2, and D3. And you say, OK, uh, Girdle and Turing are in department D1, which is managed by uh, Hilbert, and Hilbert's in department D2, managed by Gauss. So that's solution number two. So solution number three, you say, well, wait a second. Just because Hilbert is a manager of both uh, uh, Girdle and T Turing, they may be in different departments. Maybe this guy's managing several departments. So we have uh, D1, D2, and D3. Girdle's in D1, Turing's in D2. Hilbert's in D3, and D1 and D2 are managed by Hilbert, and D3 is managed by Gauss. So decide for yourself what your solution is. Would you take number one, number two, or number three? So we have good reason for which one we choose. We have this notion that we call a, a universal solution. And a universal solution is something that is uh, as general as possible, makes as few assumptions as possible. And in this case, solution number three is the universal solution. For example, it's not assuming uh, that uh, each manager manages only one department. Now, uh, if we had 
this other restraint that says here each manager manages at, uh, in most one department, then in that case, we would say solution two was the universal solution. Okay, now how do we obtain a universal solution? Well, there's this well-known method called the chase that's been used for, for many, many years in uh, uh, database design and used in normalization theory and other places. Uh, and uh, so we're gonna use the chase to get the, create the universal solution. So how does it work? So let's go back to our TGD, uh, Tumble Junior Independency, that says employee manage, and manager M and employee manager relationship There's some department D, where employee E is in department D and D is managed by M. So what we do now is we take each tuple in that in that first relation, like uh, Bruno Hilbert, and uh, now we create this, this dummy value D, this so-called label null, and say uh, Gauss is in the, uh, Gertles in department D and D is managed by Hilbert. Uh, and these, these are called label nulls, so that's what we do. And then if there happens to be the EGD is like each manager manages at most one department, you would equate some of these label nulls. You'd equate both of the label nulls dealing with the, uh, the same manager. So now something else happened. Uh, when you have a problem, many problems arise afterwards. So one day Lucian Public came to my office and said, Ron, we got another real world problem with these, with these mappings. He said, we use these TGDs to go from schema one to schema two and we have these TGDs going from schema two to schema three, how do we describe what you, how you go from one to three directly? So my first thought was, well, it's gonna be another TGD. It's more complicated than, you know, complicated, but you know, still some other TGD will describe directly how to go from one to three. Now, let me remark that TGDs are very special cases of formulas of first order logic. Um, if you know what first order logic is, you saw from writing it down, it just uses first order quantifiers for every X and stuff like that. So, so this is, but here's what that we discovered. So Fokia and Kalaita, Lucian Popo, Wang Chu Ten and I studied these things and we found the following so very surprising thing. When you compose these things, you, can, you leave first order logic. So, so you use it in this simple TGD, a special case of first order logic can go from schema one to schema two, you use this very simple TGD from two to three, but going directly from one to three, you need second order logic where you quantify over sets and over relations and over functions. That was quite a surprise. Uh, and so we, we invented something we called second order TGDs, uh, which is a, very, a special case of second order logic. And we showed that this exactly does the job, that you compose schema mappings uh, with TGDs, uh, you'll get a second order TGD, and given any second order of TGD, uh, it's the result of composing uh, 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 first order TGDs, normal TGDs. Uh, and, and so, um, and so now uh, we and we gave an algorithm for doing composition for comp computing these. So, so measures of success. Well, our uh, first of all, our stuff is used in these various IBM products that I've listed here: uh, DB2 Control Center, Rational Data Architect, and Control Manager. By used, I mean the following. So, first of all, they use universal solutions. They decided that's a good answer. Uh, the result we're going to take will be a universal solution. People weren't doing that before. Even at I, even at Almaden, when they uh, when they were working on this originally, they were doing kind of crazy ass crazy solutions. Sorry, and uh, and but they weren't uh, universal. Uh, so they so not only used our uh, our uh, universal solutions, but they used our algorithms. They used our algorithm for producing a universal solution, and they used our algorithm for uh, composition. So it was really heavily used, our stuff. Uh, now, our, our paper, our initial paper, uh, uh, won the Test of Time Award for the International Conference on Database Theory. That's like the second best database theory conference. That's when we submitted that paper to. And now something funny happened. I got a letter one day from the editor-in-chief of the journal Theoretical Computer Science, which is where the journal version appeared. He said, congratulations, your paper was the second most highly cited paper of the decade of papers that appeared in Theoretical Computer Science. So, great. But I just, out of curiosity, I sent him an email saying, okay, what was first? He said, well, it was a survey paper. We felt a little bit bad about giving it the top number one, but we had to. It was in the journal, so what could we do? So that was the top-rated paper. Um, now, uh, our, uh, our paper on composition won the Test of Time Award for International Conference on Database Theory 10 years after it appeared. 
Uh, and then I wrote a follow-up paper with two other people, uh, Marcelo Arenas and Alan Nash, that won the Best Paper Award for a uh, another International Conference on Database Theory. This was a follow-up paper on composition that showed some surprising things that, like a second-order TGD can be obtained by composing uh, only two uh, first-order TGDs. You didn't need some large number of them. But anyway, it won the Best Paper Award. Um, influence. Well, uh, this is create, create a new subfield. You know, I told you that's a great measure of success for uh, theoreticians. In fact, uh, every major database conference suddenly had sessions on uh, data exchange. Uh, and now, here's something that, that Jeff mentioned that made us very happy, that um, uh, we just won this award, the Alonzo Church Award, which is given for outstanding work in uh, logic and computation. They can look at a paper, a body of papers, they look over a 25-year period and see what's had the most influence. And we won. Uh, by the way, I was told that that for people who serve on these committees, that normally uh, people look at things near the borderline. Like if it's a 25-year uh, uh, period, they get paper that's about to expire uh, because they want to, you know, give that paper a chance. So, uh, so ours was way less than like half of that, roughly, and yet we still won, which is really great. So, oh, before I go on to very recent work, I, I was told to put in this slide here on, on very recent stuff, so I did that. But first, I want to say one more comment, and that's the following. <clears throat> so one important uh, issue is to figure out what the real problem is that theoreticians have to do, practitioners have to do. What is the real problem? So I want to read to you <clears throat> a quote from my academic grandfather, Albert Einstein pretty impressive academic grandfather. And in the q and I'm hoping someone will ask me, Ron, how was Einstein your academic grandfather? And I will answer that question. But let me read to you Einstein's quote. Uh, this shows by figuring out what the problem is, it's important. Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the answer, I would spend the first 55 minutes figuring out the proper questions to ask. For if I knew the proper questions, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. That, that's what Einstein said. What, what more do you want? Uh, this is a quote from, from the great man, Albert Einstein himself. Uh, okay, so now recent work. So I was told to uh, add to this one more slide about what I'm doing very recently, and I'm very happy to do that. Very recent work, very, very recent, like in the last few months. So I'm working with Alex Gray's department on uh, a neurosymbolic uh, computation. And one of the important issues that arise there is dealing with real valued logics, because you have uncertainty. So you have inputs to neurons, and they have scores between zero and one. You know, it's, it's, it's like a measure of uncertainty or probability, these things. And so we wanted a logic for dealing with these, uh, for dealing with this uh, uh, combining, how, how much does this uncertainty affect that uncertainty? Now, it turned out that what people had done in the past was the following. For all these real valued logics, what they had done is they had a very weak form of uh, axiomization. They said they found a bunch of things that were uh, tautologies in their logic. They were true under, uh, always true in their logic, uh, no matter what uh, truth values you assign to these things. And, and from that, they could prove everything else that was uh, a tautology is proved. I, not good enough for us. We wanted really how much this uncertainty implies that uncertainty. And I did that. I found the very, very first uh, example. I gave a sound and complete exponentiation. Sound and complete means that everything it proves is correct. And anything that uh, something's an implication of other things, you can prove it in your logic. So I gave the very first one that shows, uh, so if you have this amount of uncertainty here, that amount of uncertainty there, uh, how much uncertainty does it yield here? And by the way, I ran this by some experts in the field, experts in uh, real valued logic and fuzzy logic. It says, has anyone ever done this? No, no, no. It's the very first time anyone's ever done that. So I was very, very happy. The very first uh, sonic maximization that deals with complete, this uncertainty implies that uncertainty. So that is my recent stuff. So that's that's it. That's my, uh, and and we, we this will be in an archive paper. We're still haven't quite put the final version in the archive. But uh, uh, if uh, anyone wants a copy, I'm thrilled to send you a copy of it. Uh, and any questions, of course, I'd be happy to answer, you know, either now or 
you know, later on. So that's it. That's my talk. Thank you very much.